All right, the title of my message today, the title of my message today is found there in Luke 6:35. Luke 6 verse 35 says, "But love ye your enemies and do good and lend, hoping for nothing again, and your reward shall be great, and ye shall be the children of the highest, for he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil." And so the title of my message today is Unthankful. And the reason that I chose this is because obviously we're around Thanksgiving and it's a very common thing to preach a Thanksgiving message. Um, but I just didn't want this to be like a run-of-the-mill Thanksgiving lesson and, uh, or biblical study where we go in and we can preach on all the different verses and psalms and just there's constant Thanksgiving. I mean, we could have just studied on the book of Psalms. We could have studied on David and how thankful he was. But I wanted it to just be also of what happens when we are unthankful, you know, not only in the eyes of the Lord, but just as men in general. Because the challenge is, you know, most people will get a Thanksgiving message this week. I mean, you might even get one from, you know, just the world, from television and things. Unfortunately, they're off the beaten path. But the challenge with that is that, you know, people aren't truly thankful. As a matter of fact, most of people, most of society, especially here in the United States, are unthankful. And the reason that I did this is because, obviously, this week um, I went to a soul-winning uh, missionary trip to Imudis, Mexico, and uh, I was able to go out there and just give the gospel. And I just heard uh, throughout the day that there was 204 souls saved by maybe 25 to 30 people in a two-and-a-half-day period or three days. And the reason that I'm preaching this is because as you go out there, there's a couple of things that stood out to me. And, and, and this is not really a soul-winning message, but I think everything either ends up being a message of Christ or a message of, of soul-winning. But what, what really stood out to me was, number one, how unthankful some of us are that are bilingual. And, and, and I'm talking about myself right now, including, uh, and I'm not unthankful now, I, you know, I praise the Lord that I had the opportunity to go out there and preach the word. And I praise the Lord that uh, I was able to use the, uh, the God-given first language he gave me to go out there and tell people of Jesus Christ. But for many years, that was not the case. For many years, I don't know that I even was interested in giving the gospel in, in English, in my second language. So uh, now that we do that on a weekly basis, that's something that we've, we've grown into as a church. I've grown into in my personal ministry. But now, uh, you know, it's, it's fun to do it. In, in Spanish and in other tongues. And, and I, I want to encourage anybody that's listening that if you speak a language, period, you should preach the Word of God. But the thing that, that the second thing that really stood out, and this is really what triggered the message, was how grateful these people were that someone was out there giving them the gospel. They were so grateful, they were so thankful that we were there spending time, taking time out of our schedules, taking time out of uh, you know, removing ourselves from our country and going to their country and their city to preach the gospel. I mean, they knew, I mean, we stick out like a sore thumb in a little town like Imudis, Mexico. I mean, if you've ever been to Mexico, first of all, most of the country is a third world country. But if you really go to the rural areas, and we were in the really rural areas, uh, you know, the section that we had to sow in, in was, I mean, we literally were, uh, you know, off-road driving in this little van. We were out there. There was no paved roads. There was probably not even running water or uh, they barely had electricity because we were out there at night as well. But the thing that they were very, uh, that, that was very apparent was that not everybody gets saved. You know, that's always the case. Not everybody's going to get saved, but the percentages were definitely much higher. But the thing that, that really did stand out is even those that didn't accept Jesus Christ or maybe didn't get the gospel the first time, they allowed us to plant the seed much more uh, firm and much deeper than we even get the opportunity to today. I mean, just a great example is just today, you know, immediately after soul winning all week and even yesterday, you know, we went out soul winning today. We uh, went out into a senior uh, assisted living. And even though we did lead two individuals to the Lord, most people rejected the opportunity, didn't even let us open our Bibles. Actually, most of them didn't even let us speak to them. You know, the minute we told them we were from a Baptist church, they either rejected it or just closed the door on us. So the, the, there's a huge difference in, in our attitude. And I think one of the reasons is we're going to see here in Luke 6, 
and, and we're going to be there for a while, we see there in Luke 6 that, that there's, a, there's a spirit that starts to grow when you're not thankful or you're unthankful over certain things. You know, um, the, the intro to chapter 6, and we're not doing a whole study on the book of, I mean, on, on chapter 6 of Luke. We're just going to uh, focus on a couple of areas. But, the, you know, the intro there in chapter uh, 6 of Luke starts out with the results of an unthankful spirit. So these are individuals who are unthankful over certain things, and then we're going to look at it, we're going to tie it all together at the end. But from a spiritual leadership standpoint, even further than that is, these are the Pharisees who now they're not only unthankful, but they're also spiritual leaders. So their, uh, their unthankfulness is even deeper, and it leads to more wickedness, it leads to more sin. And actually what it leads to is a conspiracy and a plot to murder Jesus. And we're going to see that there. But the first thing we see here is in this passage or this set of passages here in the first few, cha- uh, first few verses of, of chapter 6 in Luke, we see that the Pharisees are trying to basically play God by sequestering the Sabbath. You know, and they have this argument with Jesus about the Sabbath. So let's go there and go to uh, uh, verse 2. And it says, uh, And a certain of the Pharisees said unto them, Why do ye that which is not lawful to do on the Sabbath days. Now this hits a little bit close to home also because a couple of things that I saw in in Imuris and and we actually had a a talk with some Seventh-day Adventists. There was a Seventh-day Adventist church in the middle of the area we were uh, preaching at. And and one of the things that that Seventh-day Adventists are known for is that they will go out there uh, to the small rural areas and they will give them money. They're very much like the Catholics or the Mormons or Jehovah's Witness where they pump money and then preach a wrong gospel. But that's beside the point. We're not going to focus on, this is not a Seventh-day Adventist message, but, you know, Sabbath is a big thing for Seventh-day Adventists. But one of the things that the Seventh-day Adventists focus on is the law, not the grace. You know, and that's what the Pharisees are doing here. They're saying, And a certain of the Pharisees said unto them, Why do ye that which is not lawful to do on the Sabbath days? In other words, what are you doing? You know, what are you thinking uh, doing this stuff if you know it's the Sabbath? But let's turn to verse, uh, let's look at verse 3. It says, And Jesus answering them said, Have ye not read so much as this? So he reminds them, Look, I don't think that you guys are reading your Bible, or actually, he's just asking them. But I think he's asking them because he knows that they're not, they're not following God's word. They've added to God's word or taken away from God's word. It says, And Jesus answering said, Have ye not read so much as this, what David did? When he himself was and hungered, and they which were with him, how he went into the house of God and did take and eat the showbread, and gave also to them that were with him, which uh, it is not lawful to eat, but for the priest alone. And he said unto them that the Son of Man is the Lord also of the Sabbath. And so what he reminds them is who is the Lord of all, is that if he is Jesus Christ, the Son of God, you know, God Almighty. And so there's a big uh, point to make here is that the first thing that we really notice, and you know, I don't really have thanksgiving points or thankful points, but you're going to see that they're going to kind of pop out as we go through the messages. You know, where is your focus? You know, if your focus is on the law, which usually ends up being a work salvation or on the works, then you end up having a very unthankful heart. Jesus is reminding them, look, I'm the Lord of all. But the Pharisees, they go around and they're telling people that they own the Sabbath or they know how to control the law or they know how to interpret the law for others. They're reminding them, they said, you know, why do ye do that which is not lawful to do on the Sabbath days? They they said that with an authoritative statement as if they knew the the truth. But we know that's a lie because Jesus reminds them later what the truth is in in verse 3, verse 4, and 5. Another thing that stands out before I go into it, and, you know, and I had highlighted, but it's right here, verse 11. You know, so then we see that first they're out there doing, they're, they're getting the corn, and Jesus has this, this conversation with them. And then uh, if we go to verse uh, 5, I mean in verse 6, it says, and it, came, uh, and it came to pass also on another Sabbath that he entered into the synagogue and taught, and there was a man whose right hand was withered. So a couple of things that stand out, you know, in a couple of weeks, uh, there's a church, Faithful Word Baptist Church in Arizona, uh, run by Pastor Stephen Anderson. They're having a soul winning marathon in Chandler, Arizona. And this is in response to 
four soul winners that were arrested a couple of weeks ago for preaching the Word of God. And, you know, we have to take our instruction from the Bible. You know, the Pharisees are saying that they're breaking the law. The Pharisees are saying that they shouldn't be doing these things. And what is, what is Jesus' response? First of all, He reminds them that He's the Lord of all. And then second of all, if you go to verse 6, it says, And it came to pass also on, an, on another Sabbath. See, He didn't let that deter Him from doing the things that He needed to do and from leading by example. It says that He entered into the synagogue and taught, and there was a man whose right hand was withered. And the scribes and Pharisees watched Him whether he would heal on the Sabbath day, that they might find accusation against him. See, sometimes we're afraid to go back to the places that maybe are a little bit uh, aggressive or they're not welcoming to us, but Jesus didn't care. And he knew what they were doing, right? And in verse 8 it says, But he knew their thoughts and said to the man which had the withered hand, Rise up and stand forth in the midst. And he arose and stood forth. Then said Jesus, Unto them I will ask you one thing. Is it lawful on the Sabbath day to do good or to do evil? To save life or to destroy it? And looking around about them all, he said unto them, unto the man, Stretch forth thy hand. And he did so, and his hand was restored whole as the other. But pay attention to verse 11. And they were filled with madness and communed one with another what they might do to Jesus. See, when you have an unthankful heart, you can't see the salvation. You can't see the healing. You can't see the truth because they're, they're so focused on the wrong thing. See, their, their focus is on the wrong thing. And today in America, we're focused on the wrong thing. You know, when you should be grateful, you should be thankful there, preaching the word and giving you an opportunity to miss hell, you're annoyed that they considered it soliciting or that they interrupted your football game or that, you know, they interrupted your sleep for, you know, five, ten minutes. And then the other thing is then you have churches today that have the right gospel, but they're not willing to go out there because it might be too hot or it might be too cold or people aren't receptive or, you know, that was just a different time. The, no, the excuses, the number of excuses are going, but the reason is because their focus is on the wrong thing. You know, they... Churches tend to get a little legalistic at times. They get to get a little too lawful for their own good. You know, Jesus came to give us salvation, that free gift. We follow the law because Jesus gave us free, uh, eternal gift of free life. Uh, gave us the gift of eternal life, right? It's the free gift of eternal life, and I apologize for that tongue tied. But... Too many times churches forget that and they're too worried about, you know, that checklist. The Sabbath, you know, did, did the attendance, the choir attendance, you know, did people do whatever. Whatever it is that they, they, they think is important in their eyes. So the reason I wanted to set this up is because we see the result. You know, I kind of gave you the end before the beginning, but it's important to understand that because as we go, break this down, we're going to see, so the word unthankful, because, you know, if you do, uh, you can do something on Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving, I mean, that word is found all throughout the Bible, Mul multiple, probably hundreds of times. I and mean, I didn't count it, because uh, that, that's not where I was studying. But the word unthankful and thankful, they're only found, uh, unthankful is found twice, and thankful is found three times. And, and, and I know thanksgiving and thanks, they're basically the same things, but these really stood out to me because unthankful is really the removing of thanks. And, and thankful, obviously, is, you, you know, you're doing much, you're, you're full of, th of, of thanksgiving. You're, you're full of the, the, the appreciation or the, the, you're grateful to whatever it is that, that you, you're putting your thanks on. But it's very simple. There's really only one way to be truly thankful, and it's when you're focused on Jesus Christ. You know, let's, let's, let's go here and go ahead and uh, turn to Psalm 100 while I read you a couple of verses. Psalm 100. If you guys will turn there to Psalm 100. Psalm 100. And then, uh, you know, uh, right there in verse 35 of Luke 6, just to reread it, just to go back to the same thing, it says, But love ye your enemies and do good. So we see we have to love our enemies and we have to do good and lend, hoping for nothing. 
And your reward shall be great, and ye shall be the children of the highest. For he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. Now, right here he's focused on just one attribute. He's saying to the unthankful and to the evil. So then, you know, I just, I just wanted to do a little bit because we're going to cover unthankful. So I've said, you know, I figured to myself, let's just cover what, what the Bible ta- tells us about evil. You know, the first time we see the word evil is in Genesis 2.9. While you're there in Psalm 100, I'm just going to read this to you. It says, And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant in the sight and good for food, and tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And it was just to, be, to, to, to cause mischief, to cause pain, to do something that is uh, immoral. And, and it says uh, there in verse, uh, verse 9 of chapter um, chap- Genesis 2, verse 9, it says, And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant in the side and good for food. The tree of life. So we have the tree of life, which was later removed. You know, I know I wasn't going to do a whole study on that, but, you know, they, that's why I'm not, the tree of life was removed. That's why Adam and Eve were removed, so that they wouldn't live forever in, that, in, a, in a sinful state. But it says, The tree of life also is in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So there's, there, there was that difference, right? And having the ability or that knowledge to have evil is where, you know, things start to go south. You know, we, ha- we get that sin nature. If you go to Genesis, I mean, and I'll read this real quick. I'm sorry. It's, you're, you're in Psalm 100, Genesis 6, 5. It says, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And so what happens is that when, once you get that evilness in you, and, and you're not focused on the right thing, you're just going to think about it continually. And, and I'm, we're not going to go into that story. We see now the flood, and then God you know, says he's never going to do it because since they're youth, they, they, there's evil in their thoughts. And you know that, that's a whole other sermon, but it's real important to understand that that's our nature without Christ. And even after Christ, guess what we have to war with? It's with the flesh. And the flesh is what causes us to want to do evil things. And so when we're focused on the wrong thing, then it makes us unthankful. But the reason I'm saying this is because there's a couple of things here. God's telling them, but love your enemies. God's telling us, but love your enemies and do good and lend, hoping for nothing again, and your reward shall be great, and ye shall be the children of the highest, for he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. Notice it's, he only folks he didn't say and gave the lists. There's later in the Bible we're going to cover some of those where there's a list of things that happen. You know, there's these people that you know that we have to watch out for, but they have the they have several attributes of wickedness. They have several attributes that we need to be careful for. But here Jesus is reminding us: Look, don't be so high and mighty that you miss the point. Don't be so mi- high and mighty that you're not willing to go and give the gospel. You know, I mean, honestly, it'd be great to be in e moodies for several months and just preach the gospel and hit a home run every time. But God told us to preach to all nations. And so this is where our uh, stomping grounds are. This is where we need to focus. And we need to be thankful that this is where we are for such a time as this. You know, Luke 6, 18, and, I'm, and then we'll get to uh, Psalm 100. It says, And they that were vexed with unclean spirits, and they were healed. And so, I'm sorry, I, let's read this in the context. So let's keep read, go back to Luke, uh, or stay in Psalm 100, but uh, let's go to Luke. And I apologize, uh, I'm just getting ahead of myself. But there, in Luke 6, 11, he says, And they were filled with madness, and communed one with another, that they might, uh, what they might do to Jesus. And it came to pass in those days, verse 12, that when they went out to a mountain to pray, and continued all night in prayer to God, and when it was day, he called unto him his disciples, and of, the, of them he chose twelve, whom also he named apostles. So now he gets the apostles, Simon, who was also named Peter, Andrew, his brother, James, John, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, and Thomas, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon, called Zelotus, and Judas, the brother of James, and Judas Iscariot, which was also the traitor. And he came down with them and stood in the plain in the company of his disciples, and a great multitude of people out of all Judea and Jerusalem, Jerusalem and from the sea coast of Tyre and Sidon, which came to hear him and to be healed of their diseases, of their diseases, 
and they were vexed with unclean spirits, and they were healed. See, what they did is these individuals came out of all places, and they were thankful to be in the presence of Jesus. See, one of the things that I noticed when we went to Mexico is they were thankful that we had the message of Jesus. You know, that they could one day be in His presence. You know, that there's a, there's a contrast. The Pharisees have the law, I mean, and they're, they're going mad. It says they were filled with madness, so much so that they communed one with another what they might do to Jesus. See, an unthankful heart, you know, it leads to the madness. And then later on at the end of the verse, it says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. But then the contrast is the people that hear of Jesus and they know that he, he's, the, man, he's uh, the Son of God and He's the truth and He's everlasting life. I mean, they're coming out of the woodworks. It says, And He came down with them and stood in the plain in the company of His disciples and a great multitude of people out of all Judea and Jerusalem and from the seacoast of Tyre and Sidon which came to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. And they were vexed, you know, they were burdened with unclean spirits and they were healed. You know, one of the things that we noticed is that people were coming out of the woodworks. Once they heard, there was people which just, and even if they didn't hear, there's just so many people in the streets. Actually, the one thing that's so frustrating about uh, that type of soul winning is that you just can't get to everybody fast enough. You can't go out there and preach long enough. You know, you start out and it's like you're going to be out there for three hours and next thing you know, it's been two and a half hours and you feel like you just got started because you didn't even get down half a block. You've only made it down two, three houses because you've spent all your time preaching the gospel. But that's because those people were thankful that we're there. So let's look at, uh, let's, uh, let's look at what, what uh, it is to be unthankful and then we're going to close out with what it is to be thankful. You know, at the end of the day, the purpose of this message is to, to show you the things that we need to look for that can lead us down a path of uh, ungratefulness or being unthankful or not, or, or not having thanksgiving. Because eventually if we go, go too far, number one, for us that are saved, you know, we just backslide and then we won't be fruitful and, our, and, and we won't be uh, profitable for the Lord. But the other thing is that it helps us spot those false doctrines and those false prophets who have a heart that is unthankful, and that they're leading others down the same path. The worst part is it wouldn't be so bad if they were just unthankful. You're like, well, I mean, maybe I can ignore that person. But the worst part is that eventually, most of the time, those people are going to be led to hell. Because unless they have someone to teach them and someone to preach to them, there's nobody there to overcome that and give them that feeling of gratitude. I mean, uh, just today, and it's, it, of, you know, we had so many so many experience, but today of all days, we were out in a senior uh, assisted living home, and we just had this one lady. You know, we don't always get that, and, and that's not the, the response we should look for, but it's, it's always encouraging when we get that kind of response. And we had a lady who just, you know, her heart fluttered. Her eyes lit up when she knew that she had eternal salvation. I mean, it, it, she's, she was so thankful that we were there. And we, we were already leaving, actually. We just happened to bump in her when we came out of the elevator and just gave the gospel one more time, and, and God blessed but, uh, you know, just a little bit of English here. It, you know, uh, it's always good to, to know where, where we get our words. And I like the, the studying of prefixes and suffixes. So we know what thankful, I mean, or thank is. You know, thanksgiving or thanks. We get the word thank. Thank you, you know, thanks, thanksgiving, all those words, right? But unthankful, the word, uh, the word un, U-N, is a prefix, which means not. It's freely used, you know, it's an English formative giving a negative or opposite force in adjectives to their derivative adverbs and nouns. And I know, you know, if you, if you don't remember that, just let's go back and open a book and we can read it. And less freely used in certain other nouns. But really what I wanted to focus on is not. So unthankful is just not thankful. I just want to make sure that we're clear on that. It's someone who is not uh, grateful, who who has a an evil or... Uh, a wicked way of looking at things. They're just, they're not happy about certain things. But specifically in this chapter, it's talking about the Pharisees, right? And if we look there in Luke 6.24, later on, right before we get to the 6.35, in Luke 6.24, he gives them a list and he gives them a set of warnings. Jesus gives them this, this set of warnings. He says, but woe unto you that are rich, 
For ye have received your consolation. See, sometimes, you know, we look at the world and we're like, man, you know, I go to church and I pray and I know I'm saved and I do all the right things and life's tough. But these guys, they just do whatever they want and, and they get all the money and they get all the, the, the recognition and everything. But the Bible says, woe unto you that are rich for ye have received your consolation. And maybe not in this church and maybe not with these people, but I remember growing up and one of the things that made my family members unthankful was that they would compare themselves to people who had money that seemed to be hypocrites. But God's warning them in Luke 6, 24 that that's not a good thing. You know, we, we, don't, we shouldn't focus on those things. And coming up on Thanksgiving next week, guess what we're going to be trying to celebrate? We're not celebrating that we're thankful for living in the United States. We're going to be celebrating that there's Black Friday deals and Saturday whatever deals and Sunday whatever, whatever deals and then Cyber Monday, you know, and they keep extending it out and there's pre-Black Friday sales and you can get everything at discount and just keep getting and getting and getting to fill a void that's never going to be filled just like hell. It's never satisfied. The challenge is that you're not thankful. It says, but woe unto you that are rich, for ye have received your consolation. In other words, you're going out there and you've received your price. You've got the material things, but you have no happiness. You have no joy and you're unthankful. It says, woe unto you that are full. And right here, that full is F-U-L-L. -L. I mean, and obviously the, the suffix, because we are actually going to look into it as F-U-L, which is, means full of. So that's your definition. But it says, woe unto you that are full. And it's not talking about the fullness of the soul. It's not talking about that satisfaction or that peace that passes all understanding. It's talking about you're full of things. This country, you know, if you do the statistics, and I didn't pull up those statistics, but if you do the statistics, because I've actually seen them, we have more storage units than probably anywhere uh, in the world. And, and what happens is people have houses, and they buy stuff, and they buy so much stuff that they actually have to go get storage uh, units. And th there's a big like craze right now. There's a big movement to, for tiny houses and minimalist movement. The reason is it's kind of like this, this, uh, this fight against the tide of just continual materialism. But the challenge is even these minimalist people, you know, they're trying to fill their void or be full with uh, the pride that they can be minimalist. So it's not a, a true minimalist like you're happy with what you have, you're content in whatever state you're in. You're just trying to fill this void. It says, for ye shall hunger. And so what happens is you're always looking for something. You're always hungry for the next promotion. You're always hungry for the next raise. You're always hungry for the next wicked sin or for the next uh, hit of drugs or whatever it is that you're going to do because you're focused on the wrong thing. And then when you're looking at those that are in Christ that haven't focused on the word, they're always hungry for whatever they don't understand because they just want to copy the world. You know, the world has rock concerts, so we'll have rock concerts. You know, the world has cool tattoos and hippie preachers or uh, motivational speakers, so we'll just get hippie preachers and motivational speakers. I mean, it's just, you're never full, for ye shall hunger. It says, woe unto you that laugh now, for ye shall mourn and weep. And we know what that means. That's eternal, uh, that's eternal, uh, Torment day and night. I'm sorry that I lost that word. It's eternal torment day and night. I think somebody's in the back. Uh, I, say, I think it's eternal torment day and night. It says, woe unto you that laugh now. And what is it talking about? It's about those that mock us or they're laughing at Christ and they're laughing at the word of God. And then they're laughing at, you know, what we're doing. It was interesting. I don't know if uh, everybody in the group noticed, but I noticed right before we left um, yesterday we were at Leo Asaderos, the, uh, the, uh, the place where we ate all those good tacos. And um, there was a group of, of Americans that had pulled up, and they were independent of us. And uh, we were filming some interviews, and some of the guys were talking, and then there was other groups giving the, the gospel. And so basically, we're all having fellowship, and um, they're sitting in the back, and I could see them kind of looking at us with a little bit of a smirk, uh, a little bit of condescension, whatever. You know, I actually think it's exciting, so it actually motivated me and all the others probably. I mean, and maybe they did notice and probably motivated us to do more. 
I don't know if they noticed or not. I, you know, I'm just, I'm just making an observation from what I saw around us. But what's interesting is they were going over there for whatever, vacation or fun or whatever they think they can do in Mexico. We were out there to do the word of, uh, you know, to do the will of God, to preach the word to every creature. But what was interesting is that we noticed, and even the few days that we were there, when we'd get to the restaurant, and you saw, you noticed the people that, that had a little bit more money or not. They they looked at you weird, and they gave you kind of a like a one one uh, like a looking out of the, the corner of their eyes, and then they look back at their group they're talking with, and you can tell that they're kind of just look at these guys and carrying their Bibles and all that stuff, and. and and it's nothing bad. That's just, that's just what, what it is. It says, woe unto them that laugh now. There are groups that laugh now. There are people that mock us. There are people that, that think and, and frown upon what we do, and they think that we're foolish for what we're doing. But it says, for ye shall mourn and weep. And then look at verse 26. It says, woe unto you when all men shall speak well of you, for so did their fathers to the false prophets. In other words, their fathers, he's talking about the Pharisees to the false prophets. It says, woe uh, when all men shall speak well of you. You know, one of the things that we're not known for when you're an independent Baptist is people speaking well of you. You know, in your group, in your group of fellowship and with fellow believers, you know, we encourage each other. But actually, it's not a common thing to just be like, Oh, you know, everybody's so great. We're just excited for people doing the work of the Lord. There's no ranking system in, in any of these churches or any of these uh, preachers. There's no, uh, no nobody's getting a, 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 you know, a trophy for the best preacher in America or for the, uh, you know, the best soul winner in America. We're just all racking up rewards in heaven. Some more than others. Some work harder than others. We're all encouraged by those that work harder than us that we might one day work as hard as them. But here it says, Woe unto you when all men shall speak well of you. One of the things that, that is a clear sign of the false prophets and of an unthankful heart is those that are look, looking for self-praise. They, they walk around and they want you to notice everything that they're doing. You know, it's kind of like when we go soul winning and we tell people, you know, it's by faith alone. And they're like, yeah, but you need to follow the commandments and you need to do good things, and you need to treat people well, and you need to be a good person. Really what they're saying is, we want all men to speak well of us. You know, and the Bible says, for so did their fathers to the false prophets, and God says it's a woe unto them. And then, if you'll turn uh, to 2 Timothy 3.1, I was going to have you turn to Romans 1, but turn to 2 Timothy 3.1. What ends up happening is, eventually, you know, if they're lost, uh, it's one thing. You, you know, you might be able to get them saved, but eventually you get to, to this doctrine that, that we preach about a lot. You know, at least I, I, I try to touch it on a regular basis, and it's the reprobate doctrine. The, you know, the doctrine where there comes a time in every person's life where, you know, they might not get another opportunity, where God gives you up, He casts you out, and you're no longer... Uh, awarded the opportunity of that free gift. That door, that opportunity, that road, that, uh, that direction has been closed to you once and for all. You're, you're condemned to hell and you've stayed condemned. And the Bible tells us, you know, you, you, it doesn't use the word unthankful, but it's basically the same thing. And that's why I broke down that prefix. Because if you go to Romans 121, while you're there in 2 Tim Timothy 3, 1, I'll just read for you Romans 121 and 22. It says, because that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God. Neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was heart darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. You know, I got a couple articles here, um, and uh, even though it's on another point, on the thankful point, uh, there was, an, there was a, I guess, a poll done that said, here's what Americans are most thankful for. And I'm going to go through this list. And it was a social media survey. But, and towards the end, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. But what really stood out is that they, t they did the top, thing thing, te the top 10 things that Americans are, are thankful for. 
And the number 10 on that list, not one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Number 10 was God. Number 10 was God. You know, going back to verse 21, it makes sense. Because that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God. See, when God's everything to you, when Jesus is, is your eternal gift, when you know that you have eternity through Jesus Christ, you're not going to deny them. It says, because when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God. Neither were thankful. See, we're thankful that God gave us life. We're thankful that He's put us in the position that we are today to be able to do the things that we need to do tomorrow. See, we're thankful that even though we know we have... We're still growing in His Word and in His ministry and that we have the flesh to war against. The Spirit overcomes. It says, greater is He that is in you than he that is in the world. It says, but, because, but became vain in their imaginations and their, foolish, and their foolish heart was darkened. Or we could say they were filled with madness like Luke 6, 11, right? It says, professing themselves to be wise, hey, what are you doing on the Sabbath? Do you not know the law? Right? They became fools. They didn't know who the Lord of Lords is, who the King of Kings is. You know, if you go to 2 Timothy 3.1, turn there to 2 Timothy 3.1. And in the meantime, I'm just going to point out a couple of things. There's an article posted on of November 21st, 2015. This is three years ago. And I can tell you the reason I picked it is because it's not like it's gotten better. It's probably gotten worse. I can guarantee you that. It says, why it's hard to be thankful on Thanksgiving, and this is from a psychology group, you know, which this is a worldly article. I'm just giving you a perspective of what the world thinks and, and what they've done to figure out why people are not thankful. It says, surprising new survey reveals what prevents people from experiencing gratitude. The research is clear. Gratitude is a superpower. It's interesting the way they word that, because this is not a Christian article. The Bible is going to tell us here shortly that thankfulness comes from God. That to be thankful is because we have Christ in us, because we're able to overcome the things of the world, because we don't seek to be rich, at least not like the world is, or we don't seek to be full, not the way the world is, or we don't laugh and mock at things of God because we're, we know that God exists and we glorify Him, we fear God, and then we don't look for men to be, for people to please us or for people to give us praise, we look to serve and to minister to others. But anyways, the research is clear. Gratitude is a superpower. Grateful people enjoy benefits such as improved physical and emotional health. Okay, thanks for figuring that out. Better relationships, higher self-esteem, and longer lifespans. Look, if you read your Bible, that's what it says. You know, it says, look, honor your father and your mother. And, you know, you'll have a long life. God's telling you the certain things that you need to do to prolong your life. And, and these guys are barely figuring out. It says, despite the benefits of gratitude, many people aren't grateful, not even on Thanksgiving. So a holiday that was, that's geared around Thanksgiving, being thankful, people aren't grateful. It says, according to a surprising new survey, it's not surprising to us that read the Word of God. It says there, because when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God. Neither were thankful. It says, according to a surprising new survey, this survey, which was conducted by the Harris Poll on behalf of American Greetings, sheds light on why people aren't thankful during the holiday. This is a short article, by the way, just so you know. Three in five Americans say they never do something else. Uh, they'd rather do something else rather than reflect on what they're thankful for on Thanksgiving. Top, uh, you know, top activities, respondents gave priority over being thankful, including watching football. Idol worship, watching streaming media, being, uh, you know, sorcery, being brainwashed, reading a book. Look, if they were reading the Bible, I guarantee you they'd be thankful. And spending time with a pet. And if we, if we read back in Romans 121, as a matter of fact, because of that, let's just go there to Romans 121. Uh, and actually, we're just going to go down a little bit uh, further. I wasn't going to focus on it so much, but, you know, this is the Word of God. It says, uh, let's start in, uh, 
Yeah, let's start there in verse 20. It says, for the invisible things... Let's start in verse 18, because that's really where, where the whole thing starts. It says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and righteousness of men who hold the truth in righteousness, in unrighteousness, sorry, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead. So see those people that tell you work salvation? You know, the false prophets. I'm not talking about the people we sow in that are, are confused and have been sold a, a bill of goods. I'm talking about the false prophets. They knew and they know. It says, uh, are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but, because, be, but became vain in their imaginations and foolish heart was darkened, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man, into birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. They'd rather spend time with a pet. They'd rather spend time with an animal than being thankful. Because being thankful requires you to be unselfish, right? Holiday stress, and I'll just close out this article, says holiday stress outweighs gratitude. A whooping 71% of Americans say the holiday causes them stress. When asked about their sources of stress, shopping for gifts topped the list, spending time with family was a close second, followed by cooking a big meal. So they're almost saying like this is a must, like this is the rule. You know, nobody said that that's what you have to do on Thanksgiving. As a matter of fact, the name itself should tell you what you should do on that holiday. It says despite the acknowledgement of the lack of gratitude, 92% of Americans believe that the holidays are a time to say thanks to friends and family. Yet, one in five confess they tend to be more thankful for material possessions than for people. They wanted to be rich, so they have their consolation. Lack of gratitude toward family isn't, only, isn't the only problem. 12% of Americans admitted that they would rather spend time on their smartphones than having a meaningful conversation. And so they would rather spend time on their phones than have a meaningful conversation. I mean, isn't that just, doesn't it just make you sad that people are so unthankful that they would rather spend time on their phones than have a meaningful conversation? They'd rather be on Facebook and Twitter than have a meaningful conversation. You know what a meaningful conversation to me is? is even if nobody likes me, I'm thankful that I have the opportunity. Hey, mom and dad. Hey, brother and sister, uncle and aunt and friend and relative and acquaintance, if you were to die today, are you 100% sure that you're going to heaven? Because this life is short, but the eternal's forever. You know, it's funny how people get it in other countries, but sometimes we can't get it, we get it here. How long does hell last? That torment of day and night, forever and ever, never ends. It's great. Now, if God send his son Jesus and he gives you eternal life how long is that for forever and if you mess up in the future but you're saved forever and you end up dying where do you go heaven I don't get it but anyways I didn't want to get off on that subject but just it, it, that's a meaningful conversation you know people would rather spend time on their phones because they're not in the word they're not in, in here when it said reading it didn't say reading the Bible by the way I mean, that's just another point. But 2 Timothy 3.1, so now you're there in 2 Timothy 3.1. It says, This know also that in the last days perilous times should come. You know what's a peril around Thanksgiving? Is being out in public. I mean, it's probably the worst holiday in the sense of trying to do anything outside of staying inside. You know, I, I hate trying to even just go to the grocery store on Thanksgiving because people are like fighting over all the, the deals and I mean they're being trampled and literally suffocated and killed and fighting and stabbed. I mean I'm not, this is not an exaggerated uh, comment. This happens year after year after year. It's been happening for at least the last 15 to 20 years. People get up at 2, 3 o'clock in the morning and then they get all grumpy and then they go into these places and then they create some peril. It says this know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, 
blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. Now notice this is a list of what men show, you know, that perilous times shall come. It says, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. How do you, want, how do you get a thankful heart? Avoid these individuals. But if we go back to Luke 6.35, it says, For he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. He's just focused on the unthankful and the evil. He didn't give us a list. And I really think what he's saying is, you know, we know that God causes the sun to shine on both the good and the evil, is that there's still an opportunity for these people to turn and be thankful to God Almighty for sending His Son Jesus, for them to not continue in their evil ways. But see, if, we, if you're unthankful and you continue in down that path, you're in danger of falling into this category because it doesn't take, it's not that hard to go from unthankful to bitterness, to being lover of yourself, to being covetous, to being a boaster, to being proud, a blasphemer. How many people are disobedient to their parents now? Unholy, without natural affection. You know, we have that all over the United States nowadays. Truce, uh, truce breakers, false accusers. You know, I, the list goes on and on. <clears throat> Incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. From such turn away. And you know, the goal isn't always to preach uh, a feel-good message. And, and sometimes we need to preach on the sins of this world, and being unthankful is a sin, because God is the author and finisher of our faith. I mean, just the fact that we get to wake up in salvation, that we're saved past, you know, we're saved forever should make us so thankful that all we want to do is live for Christ. Now, I understand that we need to have jobs and we need to provide for our families, but there's a difference between doing the things that God's put in front of you so you can meet those needs and then have the time to go do the work of the Lord versus, you know, looking for the riches and the fullness and the laughter, you know, and the, and the accolades of men, the wrong things. You know, comedians are a dime a dozen nowadays. But you can't listen to any comedian because all it is is just sad laughter. It's all wicked. It's all, you know, you don't want to have that go in your ears and corrupt your mind. So go, to, go, to, go, to, go back to Luke, and we're going to be there in verse uh, 27. But so unthankful is not thankful. Now we're just going to look at the word thankful. F-U-L, the suffix, means full of or characterized by, you know, as much as will fill. So it's not just the, the, the feeling of thanks, but we're just kind of almost just giving it an extra oomph saying, look, we're as much as, can, as we can be thankful, as much as I can express my gratitude, however I can show you, that's how I want to be thankful. You know, and, and one of the ways to better describe this is, you know, if you read the Psalms, David is like in, he's zealous and, and he just can't find the words and, and, and he can't shout loud enough and he can't praise loud enough and he can't sing, sing enough hymns to, to say, to praise him and his mercies and his truth that endureth forever. You know, and, and the thing that we need to be aware of is, so now what is God telling us? Look, let's go down to Luke 6, verse 27. You know, we saw the woes, but then it says, but I say unto you which hear, Love your enemies. And I, you know, I learned this a long time ago uh, from a sermon I heard, and then I did, you know, I did my Bible study on it. And the Bible is very specific. Love your enemies. Go to Psalm 139 really quick. Psalm 139. There's a difference. Because people use this out of context all the time, and it really gets my goat. Psalm 139. We're about to close out. Go to Psalm 139. And at the end there, it says, verse 17, How precious also are thy thoughts unto me, O God! How great is the sum of them! And this is, you know, this is a great psalm of praise. But anyways, it says, uh, If I should count them, they are more in number than the sand. When I awake, I am still with thee. 
Surely thou wilt, thou wilt slay the wicked, O God. Depart me from me, therefore, ye bloody men. We saw that, right? We should remove ourselves from them. Let's go back real quick, just for the sake of time. You know, we'll, we'll get it here. It says, having a form of godliness in 2 Timothy 3, 5, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. So let's go back there to just uh, verse 25, 21 says, Do not I hate them, O Lord, that hate thee. The key word is hate God, hate thee. And am I not grieved with those that rise up against thee? I hate them with a perfect hatred. I count them my enemies. Search me, O, heart, o God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. But the point I wanted to make there is, do not I hate them, O Lord, that hate thee. And then he says, and am I not grieved with those that rise up against thee? I hate them with a perfect hatred. See, the Bible tells us to love our enemies. See, if somebody hates me, I should still have the love of Christ to know that I can go out there and preach that gospel to them. It might not be as easy as someone who's receptive, but that does not give me the right to not give to preach the gospel to them. Now, if they hate God, God gives me free uh, reign to hate them back. Not me, but hate, hate them for hating God. See, nobody should hate God. We love God. Let's keep reading there. In Luke 6, 27, the reason I focused on that is because there, uh, you know, I stopped. I didn't read that whole verse, but it says, But I say unto you, which here, love your enemies, do good to them which hate you. So it's hate me. Enrique Reyes, or hate, and you just insert name, but if they hate God, we hate them. That's why we hate the reprobate. That's why we should have a healthy hate life. You know, we should look at what the Bible tells us to hate. You know, we should hate sin and wickedness and evil and perversion. You know, that's why we preach against the pedophile and we preach against the uh, trans whatever and we preach against the sodomite and the queers and the fags and all the wickedness of this world. We preach against it because the Bible tells us to hate them that hate the Lord. But here it says, love your enemies, do good to them which hate you. See, we're uh, God willing, if he allows, I'll be in Chandler, Arizona, December 15th. And the reason we're doing that is because they hate us for preaching the word, and we're still going to try to go do good to them who hate us. And I don't really think that the people they're preaching to and we're going to be preaching to hate us, but there is an opposition. But we need to go out there and preach the word anyways. It says, bless them that curse you and pray for them which despitefully use you. So, I mean, he's giving you some hard truths here. This is, this is stuff that the only way that you can accomplish this is to remove your selfish nature, your unthankful nature, and you have to be thankful to God for having this opportunity, right? It says, And unto him that spiteth thee on one cheek, offer also the other. And him that taketh away thy cloak, <coughs> forbid not to take thy coat also. Give to every man that asketh of thee, and of him that taketh away thy goods, ask them not again. As ye would that men should do to you, do ye also to them likewise. For if ye love them which love you, what thank have ye? In other words, if we go back to, uh, to Luke uh, 26, when all men shall speak well of you, you know, what thank do you have of thee? He's asking. Right? And then, uh, for sinners also do even the same. Verse 34, And if ye lend to them of whom ye hope to receive, what thank have ye? For sinners also lend to sinners to receive as much gain. So, I mean, if you're doing things just for the glory, I mean, there's nothing special in that. There's nothing, there's no reward there. God, God says in verse 35, because that's the next one, right? But love your, your enemies, but love ye your enemies, and do good, and lend, hoping nothing in gain. And your reward, your reward, see the reward, you, if you're looking for those heavenly rewards, this type of reward is dependent on loving your enemies and lending without expecting anything in return and hoping for nothing in gain. And your reward shall be great, and ye shall be the children of the highest, for he is kind. 
So if he's kind, he's setting the example unto the unthankful and to the evil. Notice he didn't give us that whole list. That's why I focused on saying, that's why I gave you that list. Because, see, if we're dealing with that, we're probably dealing with a reprobate. See, 2 Timothy 3.1, when it uses the word unthankful, in that list it also includes without natural affection. See, when you have someone without natural affection, when we go back to Romans 3.21, neither were they thankful. I mean, Romans 1.21, uh, uh, it says neither were they thankful. Then we're, we know we're dealing with the reprobate. But if we just meet someone who's unthankful, well, maybe they just don't have Christ. Or they don't know of the good news of Jesus Christ. Or they don't know of the great truths that are in the Bible because nobody's ever explained them to them. And they don't know that it's okay to hate if those individuals are hating God. Because see, the world's brainwashed you where the only feeling you should have is good feelings. And guess what? You don't always have good feelings. But you can have proper feelings and proper uh, emotions and proper reactions if you look at what the Bible says. So let's just close out. Go to Psalm 100. Go to Psalm 100. And then we're going to be in Colossians. But let me just go ahead and finish uh, reading this article. You know, here's what Americans are most thankful for this year. A social media survey showed, well, whatever, blah, blah, blah. Americans are most thankful for, and they had to fill in the blank. So this is like a social media. Number one, they're most thankful for you. I don't even know what that means. I guess for their significant other or for themselves. I'm pretty sure it's, a, it's selfish. Number two, life. Well, that's good. I'm glad you're thankful for life. Take advantage of it and get eternal life. Because this life is short for people, okay, for family, for everything. Well, I'm not thankful for everything. I guarantee you I'm not thankful for the sodomites running around the street and people that are, you know, abusing little children or sex trafficking or peddling drugs. I'm not thankful for any of that. So I definitely am not thankful for everything. I am thankful for some things, anything specific to the Bible, uh, for love. I'm thankful for biblical love. Friends, everyone. See how general it is? Today. And then number nine, number 10, God. The challenge with this list is it's, it's unfulfilling because it's not specific. The Bible gave us a specific. You know, in John 14, 6, I know we use this a lot, but it says, uh, Jesus saith, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. See, I'm not thankful for every road. I'm thankful for one road. You know, I'm not thankful for, for every wind of doctrine. I'm thankful for God's doctrine. I'm not thankful for every translation of the Bible. I'm thankful for the King James Version of the Bible. You know, I'm not thankful for uh, a specific type of ministry. I'm thankful for a soul winning ministry. And, and I could, the list could go on and on and on and on, but it, it's basically anything that the Bible tells me to be thankful for, that's what I'm going to be thankful for. And then, uh, so there, Psalm 100. This is just a great psalm of praise. Because, you know, the idea is, You've got to know what you, what you might fall into the traps of the devil and become unthankful for so that you can learn to be thankful. I could have given you a list of things to be thankful, but I guarantee you there's going to be tons of sermons and tons of information. But you, but you know what? Every year they give you that stuff, and apparently Americans are getting more unthankful. And I really think it's because they don't know what triggers their unthankfulness. So focus on the things that you're doing wrong so that you can prove them to do them right. Right? Psalm 100 Verse 1 says, a psalm of praise, make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness, come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. Is he that hath made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people, and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving, and in his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him, and bless his name, for the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting, and His truth endureth to all generations. So notice, it gave us a lot of thanking, right? Thanksgiving, and then just to, just to top it all off, enter into His courts with praise. Be thankful unto Him, and bless His name, for the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting, and His truth endureth to all generations. It didn't say, go shopping on Black Friday, you know, eat a lot of food, watch football. And then let's go look at the... Uh, uh, let's go to Colossians 3, and we're going to close out. This is just verse 1 through 15. The Bible says there, 
This is the other time we see thankful. It says, uh, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanliness, inordinate affection, evil con con concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. For which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience, in the which ye also walked some time when ye lived in them, but now ye also put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all in all. Put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. So it's, it's along the lines of Luke 6.35. Verse 14, And above all these things put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness, completeness, right? Verse 15, And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also ye are called in one body, and be ye thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatsoever ye do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. So basically, in conclusion, the only way to be thankful and avoid being unthankful is to what? And whatsoever ye do in word or indeed do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. And if we go back, you know, verse 1 says, If ye be risen in, with Christ, seek those things which are above. See, we want to seek the things which are above, and then that way when we do whatever we do, we do it. Uh, in word or in deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. See, when you do something like that, then it just removes that you can overcome those feelings of like, well, you know, I don't get paid enough. Or I don't get noticed enough. I don't get enough recognition at work. You know, my wife doesn't pay attention to me like I think she should. And my kids don't listen to me. Or, you know, I don't have the car that I want. I drive this beat-up car. And, you know, look at this guy, and he, he gets everything he wants. And the reason is you're not focused on the Word of God. And you're unthankful because you're not thankful to God. You're not putting your eyes on things above. Instead, you're focused on everything around you. And that's never going to help you. You're never going to solve anything that way. And the challenge is one of the best ways to do it, and, you know, it's because we just did it and we might as well talk about it, right? I, I just came back from it. There's nothing that gives you more thankfulness than when you're out there leading others to Christ. When you're giving the gospel of Jesus Christ, that message of eternal security, of eternal salvation, I mean, it changes your life forever. And you just, you just get that peace in you, the peace that passes all understanding. So let's close in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for today. And thank you for the opportunity to preach a a message on Thanksgiving, and, I, and I, I know there's nothing new under the sun, Lord, but I pray that it was just a little bit different than what most people are hearing today, and that they realize that there's a lot of information on Thanksgiving, but apparently nobody's thankful. And I think it's, it's good to analyze, then why are we feeling unthankful? Well, the, God, the Bible tells us there's certain things that happen, and there's certain false prophets and certain false religions that breed this root of unthankfulness and that create this uh, environment where, you know, 
this country created a national holiday to thank, have its Thanksgiving, instead people are ungrateful. And I think the reality is that we've missed the boat. The first thing we need to do is look upon the things that are above, uh, to be in Jesus Christ, to do the things that the will of the Father, you know, the first love, the first fruits, the labor. Thank you for the opportunity to do so this weekend or these past few days. Uh, Lord, just bless as we go about our week and help us to be thankful this week. And the, I think the most important thing is as, as people are out with their families and with their friends, you know, the, a good way to be thankful is to spread the gift that we've received, to preach the word and to let them know that there is uh, a way that they can know 100% sure that they won't die when they go to heaven. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.